So should we both? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to get started. I don't want to stop all of these great conversations going on, but we're going to start another great conversation. So my name is Ben Mangan. I am um, an instructor here at Haas, and I am also the executive director of the Center for Social Sector Leadership. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the center, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about our fabulous guest, Kat Taylor. Um, and then Kat is going to come up here and do a brief introductory presentation on Beneficial State Bank. And then the two of us are going to sit here and have a chat. I'm going to ask her a bunch of questions, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So first, just a little bit about the center. Um, we are a center that's been on campus for almost 10 years. And our vision is that millions of people have measurably better lives around this community, around the country, and around the world as a result of the training and the experiences that we provide to the leaders that we're privileged enough to work with here at Haas. And we do this in a number of different ways. We do it through the courses that we offer. So we offer a number of elective classes. Um, I just want to advertise a few of those for, for folks that are still looking for classes for the fall. There's a great class on social impact metrics taught by Colin Boyle. Uh, there's a great class called the $100,000 Challenge on International Education taught by Joe Doherty, uh, which gives the class a chance to actually think about how to direct $100,000. Um, and then there's a class that I'm going to co-teach on how to use uh, Lean Startup Principles for Social Impact. I'm going to co-teach that with Jorge Calderon. So I encourage you guys to check out those classes. In addition to the offerings and classes, we run a number of different programs. So we run a Board Fellows program that trains people in how to become board members for nonprofit organizations. And we also run a program called Social Sector Solutions, which is actually done through a class which positions students to work on consulting projects for 15 weeks with nonprofits and social ventures uh, around the Bay Area. And we also do events like this. We have conversations with leaders that exemplify the Haas prescription for really powerful leadership for social impact. And Kat Taylor is an exemplar of that kind of leadership. And in fact, so much so that we invited her to be one of our uh, inaugural Social Impact Fellows. And Kat has been in that role for a, a few months now. Um, we're happy that she's here talking to us tonight. She has a fascinating background. We have worked together now for many years. Um, and I very often hear Kat talk about her interest in making change in the areas of good food and good money. Um, and we're going to talk mostly about good money tonight. We have good food in the back. You're eating it. Um, she uh, is a leader who frequently steps into the arena around causes that she cares about. Um, and uh, she did that when she was the co-founder and now the co-CEO of Beneficial State Bank. And so she's going to give a brief presentation on Beneficial State Bank. Um, and then we're going to talk about her journey and the bank a little bit. So let's give a very warm welcome to Kat. <laughs> Let me hear you say, oh, 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 you deserve a bank like this. Actually, you deserve every bank to act like this. And we're just starting with a model that maybe they'd pick up. <clears throat> so I'm Kat. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. We want to build something beautiful together. I would like to use the word grow for my friend John Wick sitting in the front uh, row here. but. The economy over the last 60 years sort of spoiled the word grow. Growth, you know, you have sort of bad connotations with it. But build something beautiful is our way of saying that when human beings are around things that are beautiful, they're very comfortable and at ease. And when they're around something that's ugly, they know that there's something wrong going on. So just think climate change or predatory lending as the ugliness or beautiful is a bank dedicated to social justice and environmental well-being. And I have to say that again, a bank dedicated to social justice and environmental well-being. Not as an aside, not as a weekend activity, not an extracurricular, not a CRA thing dedicated to that. All benefit, no harm. All benefit, no harm. How do we do that? So we're a social enterprise founded in 2007 to achieve a triple bottom line of social justice, environmental well-being, 
and financial sustainability. Um, we, that doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen, um, and that's why it hasn't happened. So we had to design a bank uh, that was assiduously about that. And so we did three things. We created a bank where 100% of the economic rights are owned by a foundation of the same name, Beneficial State Foundation, which is a public charity governed in the public interest. And its bylaws mandate that if and when profits are distributed through the dividending process, they must go to the low-income communities that we serve in our three-state footprint on the West Coast or the environment upon which we all depend. That means there's also no private shareholder. There is no private shareholder insisting that we maximize profit. And I um, disagree entirely with the theory that corporations exist to maximize profit. It is just the propensity of a private shareholder to insist upon that. Then in addition to that, we set ourselves a high bar goal of uh, all a, a preponderance of our loans ending up in the hands of the new economy. The new economy for us is one that's fully inclusive, racially just, and environmentally sound. In order to go migrate towards that new economy from the old economy that's no longer serving us well, we have to make sure that the loans that we make are with transformative borrowers, businesses, nonprofits, individuals, who are doing things like affordable housing, renewable energy, sustainable food, but also who are things like women and minority owned businesses, social enterprise and B corporations, nonprofits. And the reason we pick a preponderance or 75% is if a preponderance of our loan dollars are going towards the new economy, that's migration there. If they aren't, they're installing the old economy. If the ratio are flipped, we'd just be staying in Never Never Land. We need to go forward. The other 25% can't be doing something contra mission, and you know we have a strong mission of that triple bottom line. The only way we get there is through really honest measurement. We're measuring output where the loan dollars land, but we have to measure outcome as well. Remember, banks don't actually do anything. We just facilitate others to do things. So we need to know what they're doing. How many renewal, renewable kilowatts have they created? How many living wage jobs with full benefits have they created? How many units of housing have they created? So this year, we're actually launching eight new metrics um, to get at that. It's a bit of a begging thing right now because these are very busy borrowers. They're trying to do a lot of really hard things and then we come along and say, what are your metrics, what are your metrics, what are your metrics? But I'm gonna suggest to you in a bit a model that flips that and makes metrics their core business. So why are banks so important? Here's a picture of beauty and ugly side by side. It, it, at first glance, it looks a little bit the same, but right away, you, whoa. So on the left is an aerial shot of the tar sands the dirtiest oil reserves in the world, um, begging to be unleashed by large corporate financial interests. On the right is the Amazon River Delta, beautiful hearts and lungs of the world, biggest influence on California weather, including the mega droughts. Gotta get rid of the left, can't have to protect the right. This is actually a credit card ad. We issue, uh, we, sorry, we don't issue cards. We, are an affinity card partner with Sierra Club and nine other partners uh, trying to align consumer credit card spending with the world we want to see and take it away from the world that's killing us. Um, I won't talk about much more about credit cards right now, but it's just important to know what we're after. When banks are good, they're very, very good, and they can support the right. When they're bad, they're very, very bad, and they will produce the left. So why is that? We are crowd funders. This is Occupy. This is It's a Wonderful Life. Two versions of the same thing. This one highly socially acceptable, this one not. Why is it the same thing? Banks are crowdfunders. We collect deposits from people and we lend them back out to borrowers, people and institutions. It's crowdfunding because we actually should care a lot what those depositors want to see happen with their money. Just like Kickstarter, what do you want to see happen? But banks have divorced depositors from their stakeholder base and gone way too much in favor of acknowledging only one stakeholder, which is the shareholder. In a crowdfunding model, you need to pay attention to multiple values and multiple stakeholders. 
And in banking, it's the most important crowdfunding model because it involves leverage. So when we collect deposits, which we do with the privilege of FDIC insurance, and that privilege is an extension of the American taxpayer's license. That's who's funding the FDIC insurance fund. We are enabled to collect, in our case, $9 of deposits for every $1 of equity capital we have, which means we can lend $10 with just $1 of equity. It's a 10 times leverage model. It's exponential. And we have the, the most conservative capital ratio among the banks because we're new and small and they want us to be very, very safe. Bear Stearns on the eve of the crash had 33 to one leverage. So that's why when banks are good, they're very, very good. And when they're bad, they're very, very bad because they have a lot of power in the leverage that they have and in the low cost source of funding that they have, which are the depositors who should be listened to. That's what Jimmy Stewart finally got done. He got them to listen to the depositors. That's what we need to do here. The depositors really matter. In addition to the bank, we operate a number of other organizations because we are trying to take on mainstream organizations in the American economy. Those are mostly businesses, but not all, that have the greatest chance of changing the course of history with regard to two things that are hopefully all encompassing of all the missions and causes that everyone in this room, no doubt, is trying to pursue and that we deeply respect. We have to avert climate disaster and we have to restore broad prosperity. So on the banking side, you've seen the bank model. We can talk a lot more about that. In the food, good food that Ben mentioned, we have to get to a food system that's sustainable and solves for a variety of values. And these are just some of them, but they're good buckets to put a lot of other things in. Um, so climate change, sustainability, biodiversity, and human health. How do we do that through ranching, especially animal agriculture ranching? And I was a vegetarian for 12 years, so this is rich for me to be saying this. We do it through this. Soil fertility, which implies soil carbon. We have too much carbon in the air, too much carbon in the oceans. It's literally killing us, uh, not only us, the human species, but so many others that we care about, like the white rhino in Africa. It belongs in the ground. It, there is nothing wrong with carbon in the ground. There is no harm for carbon being in the ground. And the way it gets through there is through responsible agriculture that does involve animals. Whether you choose to eat a steak or not, you need the ungulates. You need them to be trampling the ground, manuring the ground, stimulating the rich microbial and organismic community underneath the ground. Four out of five animals in the world are nematodes. They live under the ground. It's one of the most important ecosystems that we have neglected at our peril. The Dust Bowl, which I grew up thinking was a giant windstorm, was a failure of soil, soil fertility. It's a giant opportunity set. We've got to get at it, so we're trying to do it through business. Design a ranching model that's sustainable for the rancher, healthy for the people who eat the food, accessible for those who have low resources, solves for biodiversity, water retention, water quality, and especially soil carbon, which increases the yields um, on those lands anyway. Then my husband, Tom Steyer, works very hard every day supporting local and national champions for a cleaner, more just future for our children. It's his mission statement that is, we must avert climate disaster and restore broad prosperity. It's for these people. So I love the next generation because they never met a problem they didn't like and they know that the way you solve problems is to make it bigger. Step back open the aperture of the camera, take in everything, because these are giant, complex systems and they all interrelate. From us, we humans who are part of nature, to that rich soil community, to the politicians, to the corporations, to the governance bodies, to the international community, to climate patterns, you name it, we've got to take it all in and solve for everything. And that's that for now. I don't know if you noticed, but right after you started singing, like, the rock concert. I know, I, know. I did hear that. So you just sort of got them started, so I was just closing the door. So um, thank you for giving us you. not only the rock music, but the context. <laughs>
I would love for you to just share um, the story of Beneficial State Bank. What's the origin story? Yeah, uh, kind of peculiar. Um, and I'm so, I, I really don't want to talk about myself, but I guess it, it, it involves you, that. I'm going to force you to talk yeah, about Yeah, yeah, <laughs> narratives. The, <laughs> um, the Joseph Campbell thing. Um, so the, my earliest memory is actually watching um, JFK's funeral. And I don't know why, but I, as a tiny person, I thought, oh, something terrible has happened, and it affects all of us. It's not just those sad people. It's not just the horses and the hearse and the people sad. It affects all of us. Something terrible has happened. It probably cued after a, a, off of a lot of adults and so on. But um, uh, so my entire childhood, I was terribly concerned about civil rights at the same time I realized I was decidedly outside of it. I lived in a segregated suburb of California. I, the, I had bore no, none of the burdens of the, the people at the heart of the civil rights. I was too little to do anything about it. Um, but I held it dear for a long time. And um, when I was in college, I wanted to do something about civil rights. When I was graduate school, I wanted to do something about civil rights. And the civil rights movement was moving through its evolution. And so by happenstance, uh, when I graduated from college, it had really morphed into a sense that we had to solve for economic opportunity and access as well as political civil rights. Um, and so that's what I set about to, to try to do. And I ended up going to graduate school um, in law school and business thinking that I could somehow turn the economic system and the legal system towards solving for civil rights. And, uh, it was a very, honestly, a really naive um, thought, but there you go. And uh, coming out of graduate school, I was arguably the most unhirable JD MBA <laughs> in the world. <laughs> I remember because, A, I didn't wear nylons. That was a problem. And um, I also, I just had a mission that was not in um, the plan of, the, of people who normally hire from business schools. And I had a degree that was not in the plan of most people hiring for nonprofits. So I was honestly casting about, and Michael Kieschnick, who was one of the founders of Working Assets and now runs Credo Mobile and is on our bank foundation board, was then the, the first economic development director for, uh, for Jerry Brown in his first administration. And he had a fierce reputation of you know, not tolerating fools and being very honest and gruff and really smart and everything. And someone said, you have to meet with him. You've got to. So I, like, shaking, went to meet with him. And I handed my resume. And on my resume were um, a couple of summers where I worked for Crocker Bank, uh, which, true confessions, my grandfather, who never graduated from high school, much less graduate school, um, came from Montana, uh, became a bank examiner, uh, immigrated to California. And met the Crocker family and the Fleischackers. The Fleischackers were the best bankers probably in the world at that point, along with AP Giannini. And um, I have deep respect for immigrants and uh, uh, as, as smart immigrants. Um, they were starting banks with names like the Anglo Bank. You know, like, <laughs> let's get consumer acceptance right off the bat. So anyway, he. Uh, he worked with the Fleischhackers and the Crockers, and they assembled 48 banks that became Crocker Bank. And my grandfather ran Crocker Bank. And so I was every bit as bad at getting a job in college as I was after graduate school. So every summer, I was hoping to be a waitress at a you know, summer resort. And mm, I wouldn't get that job, and I'd end up working in the bank. So Michael <laughs> Keish looked at my resume and said, you have banking in your background. You should go start a bank. And I was 27 years old, and I thought, this man truly is insane. <laughs> I have two dimes to rub together. I, you know, what do I? He goes, no, not now. We should, so you should just get yourself ready to start a bank. So um, I, I'm apparently also very gullible, because I took his advice. And I went <laughs> right out and got a spot in Wells Fargo. So this is the Wells Fargo room, I think. Yes. The Wells Fargo Credit Training Program, which was the best credit training program in the country. and. Um, and I went back to school after so many years of school. And then I became one of Wells' worst lenders ever. <laughs> I, I kept saying that I would look at something and go, like, this is way too risky. We can't do that. And they'd, go, they'd be going, like, get the points up front. Come on. <laughs> so um, years passed. You're not going to have to hear my whole life story. Years pass. 
I've married Tom Steyer. We've raised four children. He's run a large hedge fund company. We've been involved in every Democratic national campaign. We are slotted to go move to DC with John Kerry and he wins the election that night and he loses it the next morning. And my wonderful husband turned to me and said, about time to start that bank. <laughs> and that was another naive moment because we spent three years researching the bank, but we had no idea how important banking was about to be. I mean, truly about mm -hmm. to be. Because the Great 2007, Recession, 2007, mm -hmm. by 2000, fall of 2008, we, we were completely educated by the uh, mentors of our lives, the social pioneering bankers who went before us, Martin Eeks at Self Help Credit Union, Mary Houghton and Ron Grzynski at Shore Bank, Mohammed Yunus, oh, they saw this, they knew this was coming. That's why they were running the kind of banks. They and they, they just laid out the picture to us and said, that, you know, this is a disaster. This is an unfolding disaster. So. Um, shame on us for not waking up earlier, but uh, lucky for us, we started a bank late enough to have all cash and no assets when the hammer came down. Wow. That's a great story. <laughs> I, it is. I didn't realize that it started that far back. Yeah. So um, I'm glad that you mentioned that you have an MBA and a law degree because you're doing some things that some people not far from here would, would probably tell you still are crazy from a business standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but you have a strategy. I know that mm -hmm. you, you have a strategy on this and I'd love for you to share it with everybody here. What is the strategy? You know, and you, I love the way you phrased it and I can't remember if you had it in your presentation or not about bringing banking back to Main Street and further away from Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a bit? Um, sure. So on the eve of the financial collapse, financial services represented 25% of gross domestic product. Another way to look at that is that's a supremely high finance charge. Because I'm the first to admit to you, banks don't do anything. We actually don't do anything. We enable other people to do something, and we do it with other people's money. I mean, like, it, nice work if you can get it, right? <laughs> and especially if you can charge a lot for it. So banking is really important to get right because we are the matchmakers between depositors and borrowers. They're our heroes. They're the ones doing the hard work. We need to respect them. Um, so the problem with the Wall Street approach to banking is it is all about the shareholder. It is only about maximizing shareholder value and it leads to crazy things that these are real. I'm not gonna name the banks. But it leads to um, the biggest banks in the world being the largest providers of capital to payday lending, which is a scourge. There's nothing good about payday lending, not one good thing. It's not emergency access to capital, it's a debt trap, it's a death trap, it's awful. And the biggest banks in the world were providing the lion's share of the capital for that. It leads to things like last year, a bank hiring 400 FTE to pursue oil and gas lending. It, at the time when we're gonna crash the planet, 400 new people to exploit oil and gas lending. Um, it's the time at which um, FICO scores are supposed to predict, it's Fair Isaac Credit, I don't know, what's, I don't know what the O is. Whatever it is. That's at the basis of the credit bureaus. It's supposed to predict ability and willingness to repay. Um, we know a very good auto lender in the Central Valley who lends to people with FICO scores that suggest by FICO's algorithms that they would suffer 35 to 40 percent losses, and their real losses are three to four percent. That's a super high wow. finance charge on poor people. The problem with FICO is it's not very good at predicting repayment, uh, but it's ubiquitously used. Mm -hmm. It's used not just for financial service decisions, it's used for employment decisions and housing decisions, mm -hmm. and that's scary to think about. FICO is something driven by Wall Street kinds of algorithms as well. It's just a super easy way, sorry to say this so bluntly, but to allow financial services to recapture consumer surplus and send it to private shareholders. So our point is that we should return consumer surplus to the consumer 
That's not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do because we need healthy consumers. We don't need them to consume a lot, and I hate the term consumer. I would rather use citizen, but it would be very confusing. Um, but we should not, the difference between 3 and 4% and 35 and 40% should go back to the people borrowing that money. And if it went back to them, they wouldn't be quite so low income. And if it went back to them, they wouldn't need to go to the payday lender. And if it went back to them, they would have the time and the resiliency to be stable, mainstream participants in community activities, including political organization and school boards and everything else. So at the risk of not having a high return on equity, and our target return is 5 to 10% return on equity, that seems plenty good to me. That's, mm -hmm. that's a pretty good return. We are not going to pursue uh, models that steal consumer surplus. We are going to try to create healthy bank customers, healthy citizens, and return the consumer surplus to them in doing that, uh, and just have a reasonable business. It's not so bad. Global Alliance for Banking on Values has tracked um, the values-based banks like ours and theirs, which are much bigger and longer term running, versus money center banks in the last seven years. And the returns are higher for the values-based banks. And you could say, oh, it's too short. Yes, it's too short. But it really has to do, it's the same phenomenon in fossil fuels. There's enormous price volatility. So the big banks are going like this, and sometimes they're 33% return on equity, but sometimes they're crashing and we have to bail them out. We're just going like this. I choose to this. <laughs> I have to step out of my neutral moderator role and just tell you that I think that's a beautiful thing. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Build something beautiful. I didn't even mean that, I swear. <laughs> um, so tell us how, like, how do you operationalize this? Tell us about the products that you developed to make this strategy come to life. And maybe like one of the things that I've observed over the years just in, in working with you guys, you've been really great about pivoting when you learn something. Mm -hmm. And, and can, you, can you maybe tell a story about like maybe something that surprised you and, and the pivot that emerged from it? Well, pivot is a nice way to say that we are a young startup organization. We have made our fair share of just terrible mistakes and false starts. <laughs> um, but thank you for that nice word. Um, no, failure is very <laughs> hot at business schools, Kat. Yeah. It is. We're, we're <laughs> failing up all the time. Well, and for that matter, uh, Shorebank, you know, people say to me, but Shorebank failed. I said, not, they didn't fail. They operated for 32 years and changed mm -hmm. the banking paradigm. And actually, we bought Shorebank Pacific, so they live on through our organization. That. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so uh, let, what are we doing? It's actually not that complicated. We are lending money to constructive activities. I mean, it's kind of shocking to say that. That's not easy. Mm -hmm. It's hard. We compete against, um, we compete to do that. Um, we measure to make sure that they are constructive activities. Um, but I think here's what we've learned. We thought what we needed to do was run a good bank that did benefit to all, harm to none, and return the profits to the foundation so that they could make grants. And those grants would be like water on bare soil and food to hungry children and you know it would be like just magic grants. Um, grants are magic. They're often quite good magic but they're really hard to measure and for a financial business organization um, they are a minus 100 percent return. Um, so why, why would we in our shoes make a minus 100 percent return where it's hard to measure the non-financial values when we could keep the money in the bank and let it go through a leverage model where it's getting 10 times the impact. Mm -hmm. How can we use that instead? So first off, what we thought was, I know what we'll do. We'll keep the money in the bank and we'll lend more of it out. And the way we'll lend more of it out is we'll credit enhance. We'll take risky deals. And banks have the most conservative underwriting model. They have to because, remember, we're protecting the depositors and the FDIC insurance fund. I, took, I respect that, and we have to do that. But we're the most conservative. We need three sources of repayment that can't be interdependent, you know, yada, 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 yada. So we don't fund startups. That's not the role of a bank. We do run three equity funds that do that. But the bank has to be sort of conservative in its underwriting. So at first we thought, ah, I know, we'll credit enhance. We'll use the foundation to credit enhance. 
Well, if you do that across the entire po portfolio of loans, you just have a super risky portfolio of loans. <laughs> and you don't even know if you pick the right ones to risk credit enhancing. So we, we did do, we do and did do credit enhancement and we still will do that, but not, that's not our dominant strategy anymore. Uh, we went back to think about this and thought what we really need is third party auditable metrics of, I'm gonna call them positive externalities since I'm with some business school students, so I hate jargon, but positive externalities, two great examples. Don't throw your garbage over your fence into your neighbor's yard. Be kind to your neighbor. Those are positive externalities. Nobody's going to pay you to do that. In fact, you can get paid for doing the opposite. You can pay, you get paid for being very, very mean, and you definitely get paid for throwing your garbage over your fence, especially if you're a large corporation that has a lot of it. So how can we reward people, our borrowers, for positive externalities and show our depositors that that's what they allowed to happen? So bear with me for a minute, but if we could just fast forward to a perfect world where we knew exactly which organizations were going to do the best job of producing 100 units of affordable housing, um, three megawatts of renewable energy, and 1,000 living wage jobs. We, we found them. We just knew it. And we knew it, and we were going to be able to prove that to a funder like our foundation or any other large foundation. And we said, for a very small amount of money, you can make sure that that result is produced. You, we're gonna enter in a contract, it's gonna sound like a pay for performance bond, which mm -hmm. is social impact bond, but it's gonna be through the bank model, remember that's leverage, 10 times the effect at least. And we're gonna say to those three borrowers, if you actually do produce those results in one or two or three years, we are going to give you a grant that's the equivalent of buying down your interest rate 100 basis points or 300 basis points, you, you name it. Okay, so this does three things. It's a lot less money than ponying up the money to actually produce those units of housing, those jobs, or that renewable kilowatts of, of energy. <clears throat> but it does, it, it instantly improves the competitiveness of the borrower if anyone's read the Paul Brest article about the only real evidence of impact is a lower cost of funds or mm. lower cost of capital. Mm. So when you lower a borrower's cost of capital, their cost of debt financing, that makes them instantly more competitive against their peers in that sector. It also makes us more competitive against the banks that we compete against routinely. And those are the big banks. So the big banks do a lot of good lending. They have wonderful community investment arms they're bigger, better, faster, stronger than us. They take down more of the public subsidy for that in terms of new market tax credits, et cetera. We have fierce competition. You might say to me, well, why do you need to compete against them? Just let them do it. The problem is when they do it, they inherently drag behind that beneficial activity a train of misery as long as California. <laughs> we need to take that market share back or convince them to decouple that misery and let it go Otherwise, we've got to compete for them with that business because we need banking that's benefit to all, harm to none. It can't stop till we get there. So if we can be more competitive against our bank peers, awesome. The third thing, we beg for metrics right now. And honestly, they're not that good. It takes a lot of time and effort to create third-party auditable metrics. Sustainable Accounting Standards Board is trying to create the motivation for doing that by... Um, they're uh, modeled after FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Bureau and Board, and they're trying to suggest to the SEC that their non-financial uh, performance metrics that all publicly listed companies should have to report on under the materiality clause, you know, substantial risk to the shareholders. And there are things like supply chain risk because of climate change, or, you know, like things you'd think that they'd already be you know, thinking about. They are thinking about it, but we've got to get them to report. But we haven't done that yet, so the metrics are lousy. So if you start paying people to lower their cost of funds only if they produce metrics, they are now going to consider part of their core business metrics. And they're going to be better at it than we are. I mean, we, we lend to every sector in the economy. We can't possibly, it's really fun. I get to learn about a lot of other businesses, but we can't possibly be, be the experts in their mm -hmm. sector. We need them to do that and then submit them to some sort of third party audit. 
There is a lot in what you just said. I want to dwell on the <laughs> metrics question. So you made me think of just one of the greatest challenges, which is in the ESG world, what is the social piece? How do you choose impact metrics and how do you, mm -hmm. how do you choose among a series of well-deserving problems mm -hmm. in deciding that you'll elevate this metric for the sake of motivating behavior around it? Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's a sort of a normative question in some ways, but how do you think about, how do you literally think about that question when you're, mm -hmm. when you're doing what you just described? Yeah. Um, it's a constant conversation hmm. in the bank and in the world, I think appropriately. So in the bank, um, um, so it's, it's not just a matter of categories. Like here's the nine things that we want to support and here's the 12 things that we won't support um, because it's a dynamic situation. We're not just going to flip a switch and suddenly everything we wish would go away goes away and everything we want comes. We have to migrate from one economic system to another um, and there are very big players in there who mm -hmm. can't switch overnight. Mm -hmm. um, so so it ends up, we end up having conversations more about <clears throat> what's the infrastructure that could switch over time. So if you have a large contract manufacturing baker that's currently producing Cheetos, but Erewhon has 10% of their business or something like that, can you, can you stomach funding that baker because they're going to be ready for when it's 90% Erewhon and only 10% Cheetos? Or, you know, so these are really hard conversations. And actually, um, um, at a much more grandiose lever, level, I am on the board of overseers at Harvard, and I've been trying to confine myself to an internal conversation about this, but um, they're in the heat, they're literally in heat week, so they're in the heat of the divest conversation. <laughs> and <clears throat> there's a lot of very legitimate fear about, whew, if we start talking about this, there's no end to what we have to talk about. I mean, look, look at complex university endowment we start with fossil fuels. Are we going to rubber? Are we going to where? Mm -hmm. You know, where are we going from there? And I have a lot of sympathy for that. But just because you don't talk about it doesn't mean you're not doing it. So it's going to be really messy. Mm -hmm. But we just have to keep talking through this. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe in the collective wisdom. I think many heads are better than one, and certainly uh, seven billion of them are much better than mine. <laughs> So we now have the opportunity in my lifetime to have a collective conversation about mm -hmm. how to get where we want to be on average. I know there's going to be a lot of disagreement, but I honestly don't think, you know, when I talk about respecting depositors, I really don't think they want us to blow the last mountaintop off of the mountains in Kentucky to get the last coal to, yeah, I, I really don't think that's the average person's vote or, um, you know, making sure that West Fresno has a 21 year uh, less, 21 years less life expectancy than mm. North Fresno. You know, I, I just don't think that's what the average person wants. So that, that actually makes me think of another question for you. From where you sit, there's a lot of buzz that values-based investing is just experiencing a meteoric rise in a way that'll mm. really change capital markets and capital deployment for social impact. And I meet a lot of people that are deeply cynical about that. What do you think of that? Do you feel like we're, we are seeing this rising tide that will make the kind of change you're describing? Where do you, and what do you see as the obstacles to sort of getting to that critical mass to like really see a tipping point? Yeah. Um, so I am no investment professional at all. <clears throat> and you've already heard that I'm very gullible and naive. So to, <laughs> to, to take this all with a grain of salt. <clears throat> And it is, uh, um, you know, the tragedy of the commons extends to the financial world. So mm -hmm. if, if you maraud about and are really good at getting all the financial return, it means you have a lot of spoils of war to share with other people to make sure they go your way politically and business-wise. Um, so I, I'm not trying to suggest that that's not a real phenomenon. You can just go to the front lines of the environmental fight whether it's Kitimat Port in British Columbia or, you know, it's just really hard to fight those large financial interests. And um, the reason it's, uh, so in B Corporation land, when we're a B Corporation, um, there's a lot of very legitimate 
uh, hand wringing over. We, we're, by being a B corporation, we're basically saying that capitalism is the system we're going to work with, and business is the vehicle of change that we're going to work with. And are we just, you know, making an apology that's going to keep us from some grander solution? Um, so that's another caveat I would put in there because I, I worry about that all the time, but I just haven't seen another system that's going to work as well. And um, <clears throat> I do think there's something really beautiful about the invisible hand of capitalism that I think could operate on non-financial planes. I'm going to sound like a weird New Age Californian here, but the, <laughs> we are in, I, I, we're, we're in Berkeley. It's yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so I mean, it's, that, that's some, that's what's so compelling about capitalism is that it just kind of self-operates. Nobody has to, you know, get together. There's no central committee that pulls levers, or you know, it just kind of works. It doesn't. It isn't working well right now f to me because we've allowed, allowed a lot of bad rulemaking and unlevel playing fields, which mm -hmm. is. But that's part of. The outcome of, you know, financial financially strong interests sort of setting the rules and stuff. But I still think there is a way for uh, more stakeholders and more values to fit into the sometimes elegant way that business works. Um, and so the, I, I can't I can't comment on like what assets under management are going to shift into impact investing. Although I do think next-gen forces are in our favor there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I talk to a lot of them all the time who, you know, maybe they don't want to do things the way their grandparents did, and therefore they're going to um, try some new things and mm -hmm. take some risks. So, mm -hmm. um, but in our case, for instance, um, the way our business model is set up, we can't go to the public equity markets because we don't have any private shareholders. We have nothing to offer them. So we have to go elsewhere, and we end up in exactly the same quarters as the impact investors, with family offices, private foundations, small community foundations, large community foundations. And what we're starting to say to them is, why don't you just make, this is not a stock offering, why don't you just make an investment straight into our bank holding company through your charitable vehicle? Get it all done at once, just like you want an integrated life or what you do in your work is not something you have to clean up on the weekends. Do it all in one instrument. Buy stock in the bank, earn five to ten percent return on your equity, so you can make some of those negative hundred percent grants that are really important. But then take your pro rata share of our third-party auditable metrics, and report that out. That's what we got done. We are capital providers of the bank who got that done. I wouldn't be so bold to suggest that's going to flip a system, except that the thing about um, the income disparity and the accumulation of wealth in such a small group of people is there's also an accumulation of charitable wealth that's mm -hmm. extraordinary. Sitting in the wings in donor advised funds, mm -hmm. massive fortunes held by people who made that money through business mechanisms who might be more persuaded to put them through a business model like a bank than they would to put them in the negative 100% hard to see what the attribution is charity found some model. So that, that's where I'm hanging okay. my hope on. Uh, Interesting. So I was actually, I was chatting about Beneficial State Bank with my colleague, Robert Strand, who runs the Center for Responsible Business. And I asked him if he'd ever heard about a bank owned by a foundation. And he came here from um, Copenhagen. And oh. he said, and, you, and I don't know if this was inspired by things going on in Scandinavia, but he said, this is very common in Scandinavia. Yeah. Yeah. And he actually had a very interesting idea, I'd love to get your take on it, where a business will have two classes of shares where one share has 10x voting rights mm -hmm. and the foundation will get those shares, right? And so yeah. you really redistribute decision-making power and governance. And so I'm curious, when you were thinking about how to set the bank up, this way, was that, did you, were you inspired by something that existed before, or did, were you just sort of making this up? I was not literate enough to know that, to be honest. <laughs> but Triodos is another, in the Netherlands, is an interesting model. And of course, uh, cooperative banks mm -hmm. um, are, or even credit unions, which is a form of a cooperative bank. Mm -hmm. I think those are the closest to the model we have. We were just noodling around in California and met a very smart lawyer. Uh -huh. Charitable lawyer, Cynthia Rowland, Cynthia Rowland, who said, like, oh, here's a way we could get this done. 
And, yeah. and it's had stages. Like, at first it was, how can we start a bank where um, our capital is neither aggrandized with profits or perceived to be? So Tom and Kat are not funding a bank and then you know, making profits off of the back of low-income communities. Horrible. So how can we avoid that? And then how can we make sure that the profits help the communities that we're trying to help and help the environments? And then like, oh, maybe the foundation should keep those profits and pay borrowers to create positive externalities. So it's been totally designed mm -hmm. on the fly. Um, now much more improved um, by research surveys that pick up things like you just okay. found out. <laughs> so a lot of what we've been talking about um, <laughs> is really a reflection of your leadership um, and actually reflects a lot of the, the defining principles of Haas. And, and one of them that immediately comes to mind is questioning the status quo. Mm. So I actually, I want to talk a little bit about you as a leader and ask you to reflect on this. Um, first, the sort of trite question that I have to ask you is just about the leaders that you have found that inspire you and why they inspire you. Um, so um, definitely the great leaders of socially responsible and environmentally pioneering banks like Muhammad Yunus, who we were so lucky. Tom and I got, a, the bank actually got a teeny tiny award at, when Muhammad Yunus was getting a massive award uh -huh. in the same hotel. And they only had one green room, so they put us in the same room. <laughs> it's like, it was like striking gold. There we were for 30 minutes with Muhammad Yunus, and he had no That's idea about sweet. our bank at all. I mean, why would he know about it? a little tiny bank? But um, So definitely Muhammad Yunus, who has paid a great personal price for yeah. being the leader that he's been. Um, you know, the great um, Martin Luther King, Desmond Tutu, um, it, um, I'm mentioning you know, civil rights leaders around the world, because those have, they, Nelson Mandela, they, they have been very important to us iconically. Um, although I will say, Tom got to meet Desmond Tutu one time because he wow. was standing in an elevator corridor at a big conference and someone rushed around the corridor and said, Tom, Tom, is he, are you Tom? And he said, yes, I'm Tom. And he said, good, Bishop Tutu is here to see you. And he comes around the corner and they have a conversation and then he leaves and they, they got the wrong Tom. <laughs> That's pretty great. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so definitely the iconic civil rights leadership um, has been very, very important to us. But uh, um, great American leaders, uh, Abraham Lincoln, I mean, I sound like a history book or something. But I, I was thinking about this because I'm honestly very, very inspired by immigrants. I have worked mm -hmm. um, at Good Samaritan Family Resource Center for 30 years now on the board. And I, I am just brought to tears and overwhelmed by the by immigrant stories. Mm -hmm. And um, and also, um, I am so lucky in the company I keep. So we meet a lot of fintech and food tech companies. Um, and when you meet a young, mission-driven entrepreneur, it's breathtaking. Um, so I agree. <laughs> I agree. I'm lucky enough to do that frequently here. Yeah. So you're describing all of these incredible leaders who um, like you, stepped into the arena, as I mentioned before, and, and suffered the slings and arrows, which I know that both you and Tom do. And, and this is sort of a leadership lesson I'll ask you to reflect on. How do you keep going? You know, how do you refresh? How do you, how do you mm -hmm. get past people that are interested in trashing folks with vision or who might disagree with you on ideological grounds that sort of broach into religion? Yeah. I mean, just in this, you know, at a human yeah. level, how do, you, how do you manage that? Well, I am definitely an Irish setter uh, maturing late in my life, so I have a moving answer on that question. Uh -huh. <clears throat> because um, I am sort of a natural partisan, and I, I love to kind of latch on to some matter of justice and just you know rant about it and fight and everything else. And um, I, there's certainly a place and a time for that. Um, but increasingly, I think that plays too much in the hands of those for whom uh, it is quite valuable to divide us into us and them mm -hmm. along all sorts of lines. And I just need to um, take a deep breath and realize that there, there, there really is no us and them. There's only a we. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that means that instead of dismissing somebody, I end up having really rigorous conversations that get to a better truth for both of us. Um, I, I Believe me, I'm not that evolved. I'm not talking about like deep conversations with the right wing. I'm talking about, um, in, we have an alternative to payday lending and we work with a fintech company on it. And there's a lot of disagreement in the policy and advocacy community about whether we're doing the right thing. Um, r rather than just say like, well, I don't care. We're doing it, so I'm not going to talk to you anymore. We have really hard conversations over and over again, and we're going to get to a better place. I'm going to have a lot of bullets in my back, but we're going to get to. A, I'm, I'm going to stagger over the finish line, and we'll have gotten to a better place together. Um, and I had a really stark reminder of this recently. Um, I mean, practically speaking, one of the things we do is uh, sometimes we just don't read the press. Yeah. We read it to risk manage, um, but it works both ways. Like believing positive press is also really bad, <laughs> but in, internalizing negative press is just not helpful. Uh, so a little bit of like, mm, I'm just going about my day. Um, but I, we were driving around the Central Valley, the two of us, and um, I always listen to the, I love driving around California. I'm such a native Californian. I'm sorry that it involves an auto <laughs> um, and, and gas it's and everything else, but driving part, around California. are in your DNA as a Yes, California they are. Guy. I'm just used to having a window right next to me. Um, <laughs> so, but driving around California, which I love dearly, and I, I love it. It's the most beautiful place, and it's also one of the most terrible places. It's like the micronation of the world. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> and I love what's still beautiful about it, and I mourn what's lost about it, but I'm trying to fight to get back all, all that beauty and but and so I listen to the radio because I want a sense of what's going on in the communities that I'm driving mm -hmm. through and it's the good bad and the ugly honestly um, but uh, I one fellow was it was kind of a fear-mongering hate spitting one of those you know talk show guys he, he actually sounded his voice was exactly like Nathan the guy who plays Pumbaa in The Lion King <laughs> so it was like the meanest Pumbaa you've ever heard and I listened to it for like 45 minutes because it could have been 1930s Germany. It was astoundingly uh -huh. xenophobic and everything else. And um, I was so glad I did because I thought that's what we can't succumb to. We can't let forces divide us so we think that we're fighting each other. Uh, we really, you know, the next morning I went to West Fresno to the St. Rest uh, Missionary Baptist Church. And I met remarkable heroes from Pico and the church and the faith in the valley. And, you know, they're, they're getting killed off by cancer from all the agro-pesticides. They're completely disregarded by their city council. There's all sorts of bad stuff going on, and that yet they persist, and they're beautiful. And they, actually, their church looks like this, like an upside-down ark. And they do full submersion baptism. And I, like, I... Um, I am a little volatile myself, but I was like, I'm going to move to West Fresno. I wanna, <laughs> I'm going to join that. So. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> sure. I, it's, it's a, it's that was a spaghetti like, mess. <laughs> <laughs> it was a real answer, though, because it's a hard <laughs> thing to do. And so this is a room that's also filled with people that aspire to be able to lead in the way that you have. And so in, in um, my class this week, we were talking about this article called Level 5 Leadership, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you're well aware of. And, and one of the questions in that article that we had in class was whether people can become Level 5 leaders, which if you haven't read it, really just sort of talks about this combination of extreme authentic humility, but very fierce will, and a tendency to sort of blame luck um, for success, um, and to look out the window for success rather than to look in the mirror at it. And, and so we had a very interesting conversation about the degree to which people can cultivate their leadership and aspire mm -hmm. to that. And um, I'm sure that you informally mentor a lot of different people. What's your what's your take for the audience? How do you how do you counsel people to cultivate their their leadership about things that matter to them? I, I don't want to like play right into the level five rhetoric and go like, and you, gosh, and, and I feel, never thought about that. And feel free to dismiss the level five <laughs> premise no, altogether. No, I, 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 well, I'd like to say that I know it as well as you just described it. I'm aware of it, but I'm um, not reading as much as I should do. Um, 
I don't, I don't know. I actually think, in my experience, the way uh, leadership develops is through responsibility. When people feel responsible for something, they find their leadership skills mm. right fast. Mm -hmm. And we try to create that ethos in our, in our organization, and we're highly imperfect at it. I mean, honestly, severe failures and <laughs> a few wins. Um, but that, but it's almost a selfish thing because, like, uh, I need people to be responsible for areas, and I need to learn from them. So, if that's cultivating leadership, then it's almost like falling off a log. I don't even know I'm doing it. But, um, and and I'm not planning on being here forever either. So I like to, I like to work with a lot of young people who are mm -hmm. taking the reins. Okay, thank you. Oh, and speaking of that, I would be um, shot in the front if I got back to the bank. <laughs> And didn't mention that uh, we uh, host interns at the bank in all three, actually all offices. So Seattle, Portland, Oakland, Santa Rosa, and Sacramento of uh, mostly MBA students, but some college students as well. And they're very fine substantive summer experiences. So uh, sitting in a business school, I have to mention that. And we've Great. had you. astounding young leadership come through that process. Fabulous. So I actually, want to turn the floor over to some of the younger and wiser, I won't use older, wiser leaders in the audience. Um, and, and maybe it's the term some, easy listening. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if folks in the audience have a question, I want to invite you to come to the front and use the microphone. Um, and just remind you, this is, these are questions we want you to ask. Does anyone in the audience have a question they want to add to the conversation? Did I leave any oxygen in the room? Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so how do you define what zero harm is? Like, for example, a few years ago, um, nobody would really know that uh, they were funding SeaWorld, that it'd be harming the environment. Yeah. But now, you know, that's changed. So. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a great question. It's aspirational. We find out, we, we, we look in the rearview mirror sometimes, too, and go like, oh, my god, I can't believe we did that. Um, but it, it only comes through rigorous self-examination through an open process. So we are a B Corp, we are a certified B Corporation. Uh, that's a, you know, over 200 questions, has to be documented, generates a lot of conversation in the organization. We're just labeled, um, which is the International Living Futures Institute, food-like label, attending to I think it's 24 areas of social justice, what's your ethnic and gender diversity, labor practices, procurement, animal welfare. Uh, we, Global Alliance for Banking on Values has a lot of protocol that we meet and so on. Um, in the lending arena, we, are, we keep revising and revising and revising our metrics to try to get at that. Um, we've done a three-year look back at our loan portfolio to see what it was it, what, who were we really lending to, and we're not going to be perfect. But we're not going to come close to the mark at all if we don't set the bar, have open and transparent conversation about it, and report out. Um, but it's a, it is the question, like, what is harm to no one? Who knew? Like, some of the things that I'm sure I engaged in when I was young, I had no idea what the unintended consequences were. And you can, if, if more than one person wants to ask, I invite you to just sort of come closer to the mic. Hi. Um, I learned just recently about the extent to which most banks get such a huge portion of their revenues from overdraft fees. Yeah. And those really come mostly from the lowest income borrowers. And I was wondering if you think that there's any potential to change that model more broadly in the banking industry and how that might happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul Leonard could probably answer this in his sleep much more richly. But so <clears throat> there has been rich transactional fees from overdrafts, uh, non, it, NSF charges. So if you uh, spend more than your checking account has, and you could do it unwittingly or you could just be in a pickle. And it was a practice for a long time for big banks, um, A, to process the largest amount check first, which increases the probability of there being multiple. Um, and there was a lot of hiding around, well, it might be the rent check. And you're like, mm, one day of the month it's a rent check. The other 30, no. So just maximizing the number of NSF charges. Um, and then the charges could be as much as 36 or more dollars per fee. And there could be no limit on how many they charge in a day. 
And the, the, the thing in all that analysis, there was never a question like, why don't you just call them and say, like, you're overdrawn? <laughs> you know, they, like, don't sit there going, like, ah, we got them. You know, like, um, so we were aware of all that, that phenomenon, and it's very deleterious to low-income borrowers, and it's very rich fee revenue because there's no risk capital there. So um, any sort of non-interest fee income is very important to banks. They care about that a lot, credit card fees, all that kind of stuff. So we did set up the bank. We still have to create the right conditions for not um, being abused by somebody who's just like, ah, I'm gonna overdraft a lot. So we do charge an overdraft fee, but what we do is when we, we track the accounts and when we see somebody is in default or NSF, we'll attempt to reach them by phone, email, so not by letter, you know, that comes 14 days later. Whoa, a long time ago you had. Um, <laughs> So we try to prevent the overdrafts. Then we process the checks smallest to largest to minimize the number that are going to come through. Um, and then we also limit the number of fees. We, we charge $25 uh, per overdraft for companies and I think $10 for individuals, something like that. And we limit the number that can ha come through in a day. At some point you just go like, the account is overdrawn, there's no more fees being taken. But then we get on it. We, we, our account managers are charged like, don't show up on the NSF list. And we look at it every month. So if somebody's you know, got 19 overdrafts in a month, we'll go, like, go right to the account manager and say, like, what is happening? It's also not, it's a red flag because they might be overdrawn because their business is struggling and we need to know that too. Um, uh, that, all that is sort of practical on the ground stuff. How you stop, how, what, how you change the incentives so that there, it isn't something that a profit maximizing large organization is just going to redound to do. I don't, I almost wish Paul would just stand up and answer that question. <laughs> Maybe there's a regulatory policy. He's refusing. The answer to yeah. that. All right. We have one. And then. Uh, I guess it's two, two questions kind of, but um, so awesome. Uh, so how do you, um, like debt transparency? So you say like foundations invested or have uh, an invest in the company and like who are those foundations? Is there an active um, mechanism which you'd want to disclose those? Mm -hmm. And then the second thing on the other side of the spectrum is borrowing capital. Have you ever seen like some of your customers come to you and want to pay a higher rate because they know who they're borrowing from, who owns their uh, debt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so far foundations and charitable organizations have not invested any capital in the bank. We're just positing this for a couple of them. We're gonna do some experimental rounds. Um, so I don't know, uh, with regard to who could invest in the bank, well, initially it's gonna be very carefully chosen because they're likely to have voting rights and we would be very careful with that. I mean, they will have voting rights. They, they could even have a board seat, which we'd be even more careful about. Um, but since right now we hold all the voting rights, we can sort of control that. Um, uh, uh, borrowers seldom will pay more for mission. What happens for us is that we have to compete on price and term with conventional lenders, and then we win on mission. So only if we are equivalent will someone go, yep, mission was the deciding factor. Um, we get in that position more these days, especially targeting the social enterprises that we do, but they're under so much competitive pressure themselves, they, they can't pay more. And, and actually what I was suggesting is we should actually pay them. We should lower their cost of capital if they're that good. Uh, and there's also, I, I'm, not only I'm not an investment professional, I'm not an economist, but <laughs> there's a weird thing going on in Northern Europe right now where um, they're doing quantitative easing like we did. They started it, I think, in March. And they ha they're awash with liquidity anyway because they're developed countries, they're not developing. So the Southern Hemisphere is starved for capital and the Northern Hemisphere is awash with it. And they're literally getting to bank by bank and country by country situations where they're paying borrowers to borrow and charging depositors to deposit. Wow. So we're gonna see some really interesting things in the banking and the finance world we can still survive as long as there's a net interest margin, I guess. Fascinating. You had a question? And then Paul. Hello. Um, you had mentioned earlier about 
in banking, the depositors are being divorced from the borrowers and, and how you're really trying to, to bridge that gap. Um, what does that look like to a depositor at your bank? Mm -hmm. And then also, um, how do you acquire these people to begin with? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're mostly a commercial bank. 95% of what we do is uh, commercial. So business loans and nonprofit loans. And we don't have a large retail consumer business. We probably have 2,000 individual bank customers. And we're 530 million in assets. So that's a very tiny portion of that. That's also a tiny number in the banking sphere. We're proud of it, but B of A has two trillion in assets. <laughs> and just to level set, the Veterans Administration is 69 billion. B of A is two trillion. I'm talking about that is wow. one big organization. So um, we, uh, our retail customers uh, kind of find us at this point through other social networks like B Corporation, Social Venture Network, um, the, the areas where we operate, they could find us that way, but we don't have a real concerted effort to bring in individual depositors yet. We've been trying to get to a place where we could really make that value proposition. Um, and we had to literally change our name and get our act together. We worked with Free Range in Oakland. They're the design firm that did Story of Stuff and The Matrix and mm. Grocery Store Wars. and. And they have totally bought into Joseph Campbell's um, hero's journey, empowerment marketing thing. So we had to sort of get our, write our approach to marketing and identify the heroes. And now what we're trying to do to um, make bridge that between depositors and borrowers is uh, recognize their hero's journey and reveal it to each other. So we do client profiles, so do all the big banks. First, First Republic is famous for them. But we're trying to do them in a more of a social media way, more of a, like a Kiva Zip way. So the, we're not writing the story. The client is writing the story. And we're doing it on both sides of the ledger. So the borrower is invited to submit a profile, and the depositor is invited. And then we are literally, since we're so small, thinking about staging um, surprise get-togethers. So we invite a borrower to lunch. And three depositors show up and thank them for the work wow. that they're doing as a borrower. Okay. Or the vice versa. We invite a depositor to lunch and three borrowers show up. And, but sort of putting that human relationship back into banking. Um, and we begin, we're not an expert marketing organization at all. Um, but we've got young people who are talented and uh, I, th I think we'll come upon something. But I do believe we need to reconnect those populations. Thank you. Paul. So I, I have uh, two questions for you. Uh, one is, um, I'd like to hear more about your thoughts about how you decided to go commercial as opposed to retail and consumer, particularly given the timing of your um, uh, uh, deployment right after the crisis and when there was such a deep skepticism about uh, banking and move your money and all of that stuff that why you chose to go the commercial route as opposed to kind of consumer serving uh, mm -hmm. entity and and then I'm also curious about um, how you think about the role of technology um, and uh, not just in terms of the sort of fintech lenders but also in terms of uh, sort of platform for uh, cell phones and other and people doing their millennials doing their banking online mm -hmm. and and through mobile phones, and how you're thinking about those those issues in your institution. Thank you. Um, uh, so level five leadership, <clears throat> accident, a bunch of accidents. <laughs> no, it's true though. Like so, um, we put our FDIC sticker in the window on June 27, 2007, and then we watched the credit markets burn down around us. And by the fall of 2008, there was a, just a full-blown recession and a housing crisis. And we, our business plan to our regulators said we were going to be half a business commercial lender and half a mortgage lender. And that's where we we're going to serve individual. We were going to get our retail customers by being a mortgage lender. There was zero chance to be a mortgage lender at that point. There, there wasn't anybody left standing to lend to. And we were losing existing mortgage holders. So the first two years of our life, we were in the trying to be in the foreclosure prevention business, which seemed like the thing that 
individuals needed the most. They were going to lose so much wealth and be so much, their communities were going to, you know, we, all, we saw it happen, right? It was like, Paul, you were sitting there too. It's like, oh my God, this is just an unmitigated disaster. We put a million dollar fund up to do soft seconds for mortgage um, modification. Would have made so much to do, sense to do mortgage modification. We, th this was the biggest whiff of the financial <laughs> system. No modifications yeah. for the first three years or something. Let off that spiral down. And I mean, people who weren't even imperiled in the first year by the third year were gone. It was just astounding to watch it. And, but that was a problem systemically that I mean, no one ever answered our calls. And so we had to think about like, why does it, why is, I mean, a million dollars isn't that much, but it's something, why is it? They were terrified that if they modified the first mortgage, it would uh, reclassify the whole asset class and everything would drop at once. I remember a very senior banker said to me, these are the sort of situations where you just have to let time work things out. And I was thinking like, oh my God, that's just the wrong answer, I think. But so, so we were neither a mortgage lender nor a foreclosure preventer. Never worked. It was terrifying to see and so sad. But that also meant that we didn't have any retail distribution model in mind at all. So we just thought, OK, that, that was a mistake and an accident. Get about the commercial lending. Start doing that. Get that to work. And think about how you can reenter that. So the accident was also a little bit of dumb luck, I think, because fintech companies weren't around yet. Mm -hmm. We knew that banking was a clunky, inelegant, non-consumer serving system. I mean, it's like, just look at the, the there's three system providers. That's an oligopoly, you know, it's like they do, you know, they're not gonna provide the best banking service. And we didn't have any branches. At the start, we had Oakland. So we didn't have the old system of branch distribution and we didn't have any of the technology yet. So we just waited and did the commercial lending the thing that dragged us uh, into consumer lending is near and dear to Paul's heart in the Center for Responsible Lending, which was if all you can do is commercial lending, then your theory of change becomes we're going to create the new economy. It's going to be fully inclusive, racial, just, environmentally sound. And we're going to create a lot of good jobs that should last and ha have good wages. And we're going to build com individual and community wealth that way, and that's going to be a good thing. That's going to be the back door to serving the individual. If you let payday lenders into that model, they suck out wealth creation faster than anything. It's just astounding to see. And you can't stand by and let it happen. You can't you know, create all this beauty and then allow it to be destroyed. And so rather inexpertly, and taking a lot of lumps, we took the same million dollars that was supposed to prevent foreclosures and put it against a pool of consumer loans where we simply went out to our borrowers who were employers and said, offer this alternative to your employees when they are otherwise going to go get a payday loan or need to get out of a payday loan. So that was like our distribution system, our own borrowing employers. And by the way, a lot of those employers in the downturn were approached all the time for payroll advance because their employees were struggling. And they hated being in that business because they don't know how to do that business. And it creates a very uneasy relationship between an employer and an employee to have a debt outstanding, especially one that doesn't get paid back. <laughs> um, so we experimented for 18 months. We totally got our hats handed to us. At one point, the loss rates were 33%. I remember wow. thinking like, well, we're doing this very, very badly. <laughs> <laughs> we beat them back down. I think in the end, the portfolio of a million dollars of loans to a thousand people about had, um, you know, there might be one or two still out there actually, but maybe the loss rate was 18%. That's still oh. unsustainable. You can't run a business on 18% loss rates. Mm -hmm. um, so licking our wounds, we went into learning mode and thought, what do we learn? Okay, the bank servicing and collection platform is terrible for consumer loans. You can't hit the payroll account at the time that it, the payroll lands there to pull the debt payment. You can't contact your customers in a very um, low cost way. We just, we were terrible at that. Um, so at that point in time, the FinTech companies started to arise and guess what was one of the things they were fixing? It's all the clunkiness of the banking model. 
they actually can't replace banking because they generally cannot replicate the compliance function, which is underwriting, fair lending, know your customer, Bank Secrecy Act. They just, they can't do that all themselves. They can be compliant with it, but they can't serve up what the regulators need to see in order to accord the FDIC insurance. And without FDIC insurance, you don't have the lowest cost funding in the country, which is deposit funding. So I don't think FinTech is ever gonna totally, it's not gonna replace banking, but it's gonna bolt on on both sides a lot better systems because of technology platforms um, that's absolutely revolutionizing, revolutionizing banking. But we're only interested in working with FinTech platforms that give the consumer surplus back to the consumer. And that's generally expressed through a mission that looks a lot like ours. Um, and guarded by metrics that look a lot like ours. Mm -hmm. So the way we're getting into retail markets now in a way that's helpful to what Paul's calling out is a gaping need that individuals need fair and transparent banking services um, is first through, I'll call it pre-prime consumer lending. So providing an alternative to payday lending. We're um, in a beta pilot on a an unsecured credit card for pre-prime, meaning under 660 FICO scores. Because actually, the way most of us manage our cash flow um, ver, uh, sort of volatility is with a credit card. But the shocking thing is, right now, 62% of millennials don't have a credit card. It's 18 to 35 year olds don't have a credit card, which means they are not laying down a credit record that's recognizable to the, any of the bureaus or the FICO system, which means when they go to borrow money to buy a car or a house, they are only going to have predatory sources available mm -hmm. to them unless we create some more product. We have to create some pre-prime consumer product. Um, so I, I'm gonna ask you a question somewhat related to this. Um, our conversation has really ranged about the way you guys have innovated to position consumers to be better off and to increase their individual agency. But you know that takes you to a certain point, and then there's still this this need for some level of regulation to avoid bad mm. behavior by payday lenders and Absolutely. others. Absolutely. So you sit in a really interesting position where, like, you bear the cost of the fixed cost of any regulatory burden for any financial institution, and face it when you try to innovate. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you, how are you feeling about banking regulation these days? Yeah. And like, where do you where do you um, based on your experiences, see yeah. it needing to improve. Yeah. Well, it's almost like a cultural thing that if you're a banker, you're supposed to... Hate regulations. Yeah, gripe right. about regulations and regulators and stuff. But we don't... We actually embrace our regulations and regulators, mm -hmm. and we've worked hard to find the ones that are the best fit for us because you have options. You know, we were originally regulated by the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. Then, because of the crisis, they folded them into the... Excuse me. We were originally with the... OTS, the Office of Thrift Supervision. That's where thrifts and savings and loans were. That's really mm -hmm. the original crowdfunding model, but they got folded into the OCC, so then we were OCC, and then we weren't, because we weren't a retail bank, we weren't meeting our thrift regulations. Um, so we were gonna have to become a national bank. So, so we were in like, oh, we gotta look at our charter and who do we wanna be regulated. We ended up switching. You would think, or I would have, I thought, we need to be a national bank. That's the most powerful charter. It has uh -huh. preemption over state regulations. That, that's what we need to do. We're in three states. So, well, actually, when we went to talk to the state of California, just for ducks, just uh -huh. like, well, I guess we should look at this. Like, maybe it's, I was not thinking we were going to end up there at all. Um, 20 minutes in the conversation, Jan Owens, who is the head of the Department of Business Oversight, which regulates California state banks and all loan funds and all money service businesses, which includes payday. She has a massive responsibility. 20 minutes in the conversation, after enduring seven years of our federal regulators going, why are you in the payday loan business? Please get out of there. We know it's supposed to be an alternative, but it looks like payday. It's bad business. You're not going to make any money. Like, just stop that. Jan Owens looked at me and she said, how are you going to help us solve the terrible problem of payday lending in the state? <laughs> and he was like, 
So you literally did we got married embrace, right there. You, yeah, you literally did embrace. We do the embrace, and the CFPB, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, run by Richard Cordray and started by Elizabeth Warren, we completely back what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be some inefficiency in regulation? Always. Yeah. But they have got to fight for consumers, and they are. And they've just, Paul's nodding his head, they've just released some guidelines around payday that we totally support that will put a lot of payday out of business. Mm -hmm. But it is not just regulation and policy. We have to create market alternatives because, mm -hmm. as Paul also knows, there's a lot of illegal payday that just, they don't care about regulations. They're just illegal. And they live online or offshore or on tribal res reservations, yeah. wherever they can hide. So um, between good rules well enforced by our regulators and a market alternative that steals market share i think we can blunt the okay. but we do like our regulators that's good and that's, i'm not just saying that. i'm not sure i've heard that in this room before <laughs> i know so um are there any other questions in the audience why don't you come on up CDFIs, who you compete with the most, mm -hmm. and then thinking about that, how do you position yourself just from a business, loan products, underwriting, how you compete, how you differentiate, yep, differentiate yeah. yourself. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we b b practice cooperation like the credit unions. So we think we have to bring our best game, and everyone else should too, and it sh they shouldn't just sort of randomly hand out deals. You should compete to get the deals. I, and I was in a meeting today where we're competing against a CDFI who we know and love very, very well, and a, a Silicon Valley Bank who we know and think they're really good, but they're not a CDFI. And we just bring our best game. And, and it should go to the best bank in, in that setting. Um, but I think, um, and how we compete is we, we definitely have to be uh, very competitive on price and term, but also I think what we can do because of our size and our orientation and what the other CDFI can do as well is really know the business of our borrower. So we, rather than spend one hour sort of getting our marching orders, we spent two hours asking them, they happen to be a publisher, a lot of change in the publishing business. Like tell us we're hungry to know everything about your business so that we could try to anticipate what their financial needs are, how we can make them better at their job. And they are very, very mission driven. So we're thinking not only just better financial performance for you, but what can we bring to the table that helps you excel on all your metrics. Um, but the larger issue, I think, is one that uh, because of kind of a, a, a association of competition with like the, the old economy that we're trying to leave behind, sometimes we are a little too beholden, or our community, progressive community, too beholden to like, super local or super little or extremely responsive or you know kind of and then we suffer in scale and you can't survive so in my our feeling is that almost every community bank in the country is subscale subscale for bank economics but also subscale for impact and we don't need to be so we do engage in what i will call gentle mergers we're constantly looking to find bank partners for whom it might make sense. Maybe we just combine a business line. Uh, maybe we license something or to them or they to us. Or maybe we go ahead and combine the institutions. But we've got to get a little bit bigger or we just can't have the impact and the resiliency. So that makes me think of another question. Just I noticed on your website you just hired a seasoned M&A person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and. I would love to hear, and maybe I'll make this the last, I'll take the, the uh, prerogative of making this the last question of the night, but so where, where are you guys headed? Where is Beneficial mm. headed? Yeah. You know, at, at, at the sort of business commercial level and also at the leadership level, because you have, you have pushed the boundaries on so many different really key social impact issues. Tell us where you guys are going. What, what beautiful things are you aiming to create <laughs> Um, well, thank you for phrasing it that way. We did hire uh, Jennifer Finger, from, who is the sitting CFO at West America Bank. And to us, that was a really positive sign about human capital migration, too. She's you know, a very, very senior banker. She's presided over on, in the finance function over a lot of M&A activity. She's um, run um, 
payment processing businesses and other you know areas that we're super interested in. But most importantly, she really wanted to come over for the mm. mission. She's a supremely nice person, incredible talent, but she wanted to work for a mission bank, and that, that just speaks volumes right there. Um, and she is an indication of where we're trying to go. So in order to be accountable, we think we have to be responsive. And uh, even three states is pretty big area to be responsive to. Mm -hmm. So we do not have plans to be national in coverage unless it's something like the accountable affinity credit card, which is not so much a, you know, it's, it's a movement. You don't necessarily have to be locally present to do that. Um, so the three West Coast states are the ones where we want to make hay while the sun shines. Uh, we have business lines and products um, that seem very important to uh, a full complement of fair and transparent beneficial banking services. I would say they include auto lending, uh, more access to credit, so credit building products, secured credit cards, things like that. Um, we are not as busy in some sectors as we'd like to be. So like in sustainable food systems, we're really in the middle of the supply chain. We don't have an ability to be in land and crops or that much in retail. So filling in um, existing product lines to be more impactful. Um, we're, we're kind of disconnected nodes. So we have a branch in Seattle, Portland, uh, Oakland, a loan production office in um, Santa Rosa and Sacramento. So we need to do a lot of geographic fill in mm -hmm. and we need to get to Southern California um, and the Central Valley. They're cheering important. for you, do you hear that? <laughs> 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 um, and we probably need to grow to be, you know, more like five billion in assets or something like that. But at that point, we want to let the model run, mm -hmm. um, work on the ecosystem around it. I mentioned we run three equity funds to try to attend a startup and uh, growth stage companies. Um, we're working a lot in metrics development. Um, you know, we, we have to make the ecosystem healthy too. Mm -hmm. um, so Jennifer's a very important hire for all those reasons and that's personally where I'm, um, so I'm like the weirdest CEO of a bank that anyone will ever meet and we're, we're going to normalize our CEO function at some point. Um, so we are working very hard at succession in the bank and the migration of human capital into a pipeline so that we have a lot of talented people with great growth opportunities in a career that they can be very proud of um, and build out the bank and um, move me up into the bank holding company. And then I, I love the design side of this. So I'll, I'll always try to be, a, and I am um, uh, very feisty about the mission and the metric measurement part of it. So I'll always be involved in that. But I hope I get to work more with my husband in future, to be perfectly honest, in the great state of California and beyond. Well, we'll be rooting for you, Kat. Thank you <laughs> Thank so you. much for being here with us tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much. For, thanks, Ben, very much. <laughs>